Hello again, as you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and today's class is Open Mesh Introduction. So Open Mesh is a company that creates some very interesting wireless mesh equipment, and it's one of those things that I really think you guys should take a look at because it is very uh, inexpensive, it is very versatile, and from what I can see, it works very well. So Open Mesh, what they do is they create mesh wireless equipment, and it's important that you understand understand they only create mesh wireless equipment, right? So I, when I was I was talking on the phone to the guys over at Open Mesh and I was trying to figure out what their business is and what all the other networking equipment was and it kind of took a minute to get through my head for that to, to realize all they create is mesh wireless access points. That's it. They don't build switches. They don't build routers. They don't build wireless routers. All they build is mesh wireless access points. So that's a very important thing to understand if you're going to be dealing with open meshes, that's all they build. So what you're gonna do is if you wanna create a mesh wireless network, you buy the mesh wireless access points from them, and then one of these access points or more has to connect into normal networking equipment. Cisco routers, Cisco switches, Netgear routers, Netgear switches, something like that. So the base station for this, where this connects into your network, there's no no DHCP server, there is no DNS server, there is none of that stuff. These are simply mesh wireless access points for DNS, DHCP, all of those services that you're normally used to getting out of what you would consider a wireless router, you're not going to get out of this. So what are we talking about when we talk about wireless mesh networks and me wireless mesh access points? Basically what happens, and this is really, really cool with this, uh, uh, this open mesh gear, is what you do is you go out and you put all of these mesh wireless access points throughout your facility, right? One of these, or two, or a couple, get connected into your normal network. So there is an actual normal uh, RJ45 jack on this that, that, would, that would get plugged into your switch or your router. But only one or two of these mesh wireless access points would actually get uh, connected into your hardwired uh, network. The rest of the mesh wireless access points will actually create a mesh network using the connections from the other access points. So basically, you connect this access point into the network, and then what you do is you take this access point, a different access point, you simply plug power into it. You don't plug a network cable into it, you simply plug power into it, and this then will connect to the first access point in order to get internet access. So you are sitting on your laptop computer, you connect to this access point, this access point basically then relays the data to this access point, which then sends it into the hardwired network to go out to the internet when the information comes back, it comes back in through the internet, in through the router, in through the switch, out through this, into this, then out so on and so forth. So that is what makes uh, mesh networks so nice, is you don't have to run hardwired network cabling to every single access point. They just automatically create uh, uh, the, the network for you. The other thing that's really nice with these mesh networks is they use point to multi-point uh, connections. So what that means is each one of these mesh wireless access points can be connected to multiple other mesh wireless access points. So if one access point fails, this, one, this guy can simply connect to a different one, right? So this guy, let's say, can see four or five or six or three different access points. If the, the access point in normally goes through the to, to get to the internet fails, it will simply hop through a different wireless access point to get to the, the outside world. This is what is called self-healing networks. So basically you don't have to go in, you don't have to change any configurations, you don't have to do any of that. It will self try to it will try to heal itself on its own and will keep doing so until so many uh, wireless access points fail uh, that it can't it can't get any connection to the outside world. So that's what we're dealing with 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 the, these open mesh wireless access points. So it's very important what to understand though, when you buy these, again, you have to have a normal router and switch to connect at least one or two of these into to make the system work. They, for whatever reason, 
for whatever reason I don't really understand, they only sell the access points. Now whenever you're going to be dealing with the access points, uh, there are a couple of things you actually have to purchase whenever you're buying these things, right? So again, that's one of the tricks you have to realize uh, whenever you're buying networking equipment is to make sure you buy everything, right? When you go out and buy a computer, you expect to get everything with it, basically, you know, keyboard, mouse, if you buy a set, monitor the whole nine yards. One of the issues uh, when you go out and buy networking equipment is sometimes they don't even give you the power cords. So you have to make sure you're getting everything that you need whenever you're buying this equipment. And so whenever you're buying open mesh equipment, uh, there's three different things you have to make sure that you are going to buy uh, in order to make it work. The first thing, obviously, is the access point. So they've got like four or five different of these mesh access points. Uh, this, this is the bigger one, more powerful one. This is one of the smaller ones. So you have to go out and you have to spec out which access points you want to buy, and, and then you buy those. But that's, that's not the end of it. So once you buy the access points, then you have to figure out the power for your access points. So all of these access points can be plugged in using a normal adapter, or they can be plugged in using power over Ethernet. So depending on how many of these access points you're going to use, you either need a PoE injector, so this injects power into the Cat5 cable, or you need a power over Ethernet switch. Again, that depends about how you're building out the infrastructure, but do realize you're going to have to figure out how to power these things. So you can either use a normal adapter or you can use power over Ethernet, whatever you do, just make sure you're getting that in the package. Then beyond that, you have to think about the enclosure that you're going to put these guys into. One of the things that I really like with Open Mesh that a lot of other companies don't do is that Open Mesh basically just sells you the standard equipment. And then depending on how you want to use the equipment, you buy an additional enclosure to make that work. So if you deal with companies like Cisco or Linksys or Netgear, they, they sell a zillion different wireless access points. One wireless access point is an external wireless access point. One uh, wireless access point is used for industrial environments. One wireless access point is used for business environments. One wireless access point is used for residential environments. And so they have different form factors and all that kind of stuff. The nice part with open mesh is you buy just your standard mesh access point from them, and then you add enclosures to those access points to make them them useful for whatever environment you're going to be putting them in. So let's go over to a little demo table so I can kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about with this, because that probably sounds a little bit confusing, right? Okay, so here it is. So this is a wireless access point. Uh, and this is a wireless access point. So you bought this wireless access, these wireless access points, and now you're trying to figure out what environment are we going to put these wireless access points in. Well, let's say I want to take, I, I want to use this wireless access point for an external environment. So I'm looking at my building, and I go, um, I have got a smoking area where I want people to go out and let's say be able to smoke, but they also need to be able to get alerts on their smartphones if they're out there. So what I want to do is I want to take this little access point and put it outside so you get uh, you get wireless signal outside. So what you would do is you would go and you would find the external enclosure. So this is their external enclosure. And let me see if I can pull this thing open. Oh, and of course I forgot my stupid little tool in order to do this properly. Hold on a second. And of course, being, being a good piece of equipment, it's a little difficult to open up. Come on. Come on. There we go. Okay, so we pop that open like that. So this is the mounting bracket. So this would get screwed to the wall, or this would get connected to like some kind of outside post or something like that. And then what happens is you just pull this open, right? And then you take your you take your um, mesh wireless access point and you just connect it in like this. And so it connects using little latches. From here, what you would do is you would either connect in the, the, the network connection with power over Ethernet, or you would use your power adapter. You would plug that in. You then slide this. Oops. You then slide this in and put it on the bracket. And now you have an external access point. So you use the same access point, but now because it's in this external case, you're able to use it out in the, the dirty world, right? So that's an external access point. Beyond that, then they have other things such as, let's say this is in, in an office environment and you want to mount this on the ceiling. So you have drop ceilings and you want to you make this all pretty and you want to mount it to the drop ceiling. What you can do is you can use this particular uh, enclosure. All you do is you flip this over 
you connect the, uh, the access point underneath. It has a clip I don't have with me. And then what you can do is you can secure this uh, to your drop ceiling or to your wall. And now it looks again like a pretty professional access point. So you can do something like that. Then they have other creative things that I really like. So what this is, is this actually allows you to connect your uh, wireless access point directly into a wall outlet, right? So what you do with this particular one is, let's say you have a, a, an electricity outlet for the wall, you know, so you have the, the little prongs normally, you, you know, where you plug one of these guys into, and you want to turn that into uh, a repeater for this wireless access point. So what you can do is you just take this, you plug that in here, right? Then what you do is you put this on top, you clip that in, you run the power cable around in here. You take all this, uh, and of course, because I'm doing this live on video, it looks all nasty. And then basically what you do in a much neater fashion is then you put this in here and so what you can do is you can then connect this directly into a wall outlet. So let's say you're in a hotel environment or again an office environment when, where you want to provide that wireless signal. You want to make sure it's always plugged in. So what you can do is you can just put this onto that wall outlet. It always has power. It just looks like another just weird little piece of equipment on the wall and nobody thinks twice about it. It looks nice, looks pretty. This isn't something like if you leave if you leave this on the floor, A, it looks ugly as hell, and B, somebody might unplug it. If all, all somebody sees is basically this plugged into the wall, then nobody's even going to think twice about it. It's going to look nice and neat, and people just aren't going to mess with it. Beyond that, they also have like this to kind of uh, enclosure. And so with this, again, you, uh, you put your access point in here. This is another one that goes on the wall with outlets. And so the idea is that this screws into the wall where you have network cables running. So one of the network cables can go up into uh, the access point to power it and run it. And then you can have network cables on the outside. So this would act as both a, a wireless access point and a hardwired connection if you want that. So those are the types of things you can do with these small little uh, access points that they give you. Again, all you do is you put it into a different enclosure and that's it. Then now this is the big guy. So this is a more powerful access point. And the question is again, you know, what are you going to do with it? So with this, you can again put this in the external environment or into an environment where it's a little nastier. This pops off, you screw this to the wall. Once that's screwed to the wall, you connect that. And then once you've done that, you put, you put this in, network cable runs up through here. Again, remember it's power over ethernet. And then once that's happened, you swivel this around, oops, well, Oh, this is a pain in the butt to show you guys on live. But uh, basically, you push this in there like that. Line it up with a cable. And then you put that so it has a seal. And so again, this can be screwed into an external environment. It's relatively, it's water resistant. I'm not quite sure I'd say it's perfectly waterproof, but it definitely this is something that you can put out. Again, you can screw into a courtyard, you can put on an outside wall, you can put into an industrial setting, uh, and, and it worked pretty well. So these are the different, different types of uh, accessories that you can look at whenever you're going to be purchasing any of this open mesh equipment. Now, if we go over to the computer, just to show you a little more, uh, you can get an idea. So basically, if you're interested in this, you go to open-mesh.com. You can go over here and we can take a look at the different access points. Now, again, one of the things to be thinking about whenever you're going to be buying equipment is to make sure you purchase the right equipment. Don't just look at price. So with this, these access points go from anywhere from $55 all the way up to $225. Don't just buy things because they're inexpensive. What we're going to do is we're going to click on this more specs and we're going to take a look at the uh, the different specifications for these access points. So with the $55 version one, the max speed, the max throughput is 150 megabits per second. Uh, 
power at max speed, 100 milliwatts. It has a single internal antenna, 2.4 gigahertz, and it has all of this different stuff that you can take a look at. Max users, theoretically, is 256 per access points. Max users recommended is 20 to 50 per access point. Now, I do have to tell you, uh, this is not a review. This is just an introduction to these guys. I'm not sure how much I would trust this. Um, not that not the open mesh guys are untrustworthy. That, that's just a lot of clients on a single access point, I have to tell you. So again, one thing you have to think about is whenever you're buying this equipment, one, look at the specifications, and then two, make sure to test this out in your own environment. Because if this, if each access point really can support 20 to 50 uh, users, that's really awesome. Um, but that, that seems a little bit steep there. And then the other thing you have to look at is maximum real per user speed. So whenever you're talking about things like speed, this is the overall throughput. So if you've got 20 to 50 users, total 150 megabits per second can be pushed through this thing. But the maximum per user real speed is 80 megabits per second. So that's one of the things to think about. So we can go over here, we can look at the different ones, you know, general use. Um, you know, we've got the, uh, basically, uh, this right here, the OM2P-LC has a single internal antenna. So that's fine for most environments. Why this OM2P is different is you get a single external antenna. So an internal antenna is good for, for almost all environments, but if you're gonna be setting something up in a specialized environment, or maybe it needs to be long range, so you need to put external antennas on the access points for them to be able to talk to each other, you may have to go with the, the external antenna version. Beyond that, we go over, uh, they have the OM2PHS, this is able to put 300 megabits per second through, has dual internal antennas, uh, up to 95 megabits per second real user speed, uh, five gigahertz, so on and so forth. So basically what you do is you go through and you, you try to figure out uh, which one of these, these access points will do the best for you in the specific environments. And so one of the things you really have to think about is when you're gonna be buying mesh equipment, is you're probably gonna be buying a lot of this, right? And that's an important thing to, to think about whenever you're gonna be buying equipment is, is think about how much of it you're going to buy and how specialized you should be. So normally, uh, when you're going out and you're buying Cisco switches or Juniper switches, right, you just buy the biggest freaking thing you can afford, right? 48 port gigabit switch from Cisco for $3,000. It's mine. I got three, the company gave me $3,000. It's $3,000. That's what I'm going to buy, right? Because it doesn't matter if you have a printer connected to that switch or if you have your server with a gigabit per second connection connected to that switch, all the computers have to use that specific switch. So you have to buy the best single piece of networking equipment possible because everything is going to go through it. If, if you buy something that's only good for your printers uh, and then your server gets hammered, with traffic, you're gonna have problems. Well, the thing is to understand with these little mesh networks, is you're not gonna have, a, generally, you're not gonna have a lot of users per access point. And these access points are going to be put into very specific locations, right? So let's say you have a, uh, a little uh, conference room. So you have a little conference room um, that's probably gonna have 10 people in that room at most at any one time, right? So if you put one of these mesh access points in there, all you have to do, you only have to buy a mesh, mesh access point that is good enough to support 10 users. On the other hand, let's say you have a cafeteria uh, where you're gonna have 200 people in there at any one time, then you have to buy a mesh access point there that can support up to 200 users, or you have to buy two or three mesh access points that will support that many users. So that is one thing to be thinking about whenever you buy this mesh equipment, is you don't have to buy one type of mesh equipment. It's not like you either buy 50 of these or 50 of these. You can buy 20 of these, and 10 of these, and 15 of another type, and five of another type, and mix and match. So I might go and buy the $55 mesh access point for the CEO's office. So I want the CEO to have the best connection possible, but I know he's gonna be the only one using that particular access point. So I can use a $55 access point for him because I know it's essentially dedicated just for him. Whereas again, I go into the conference room, that's where I go and I buy the $100 version for the conference room uh, because 
because I know up to 10 people will be using it there. Then I go to the cafeteria, I buy the $250 version there uh, because, again, up to 200 people are going to be using it at any one time. So that's one thing to be thinking about with this mesh equipment is make sure you buy the right equipment for each circumstance that it's going to be used in. You don't have to buy 50 of these or 50 of these. Again, 10 of these, 10 of these, 15 of the other, so on and so forth. So that's the basic overall with the form factor and the specifications with these. Now, what I like about open mesh uh, and what makes this very good for a lot of, of small environments or environments where the company can't spend a lot of money for a network administrator is you can administer all this equipment using their web interface. So what's really, really cool with this stuff, right? As you go out and you buy five of these or 500 of these. Um, and then what happens is you plug one of these into your network. Then you start plugging uh, all of the other uh, mesh wireless access points into power. And what will happen is they will all find each other. Uh, and then they will find the, the mesh access points that have a connection to the outside world. So that's that's basically all you have to do is what you do is you, you plug in a whole bunch of these simply to power connect connections, and then you plug in one or two or three of these uh, with an actual local area network connection so that they can get to the outside world, all of the wireless access points will start automatically communicating with each other, and then they will communicate with the server that OpenMesh runs. And what you'll do is you'll go to a website called cloudtracks.com to be able to administer all of your access points. What happens is when you go to cloudtracks.com, uh, what you're going to have done is you're going to you're going to have written down the MAC addresses for all of your different wireless access points. So when you go to cloudtracks.com, what you're able to do is you're able to enter those MAC addresses um, and associate them with your account. Once that happens, you are then able to control all of the access points that are now in your environment. And from the one interface, you can make all the modifications and changes you want. So if you deploy 50 wireless access points, you do not have to connect the 50 access points to change the SSI ID or anything like that, what you can do is you can simply connect to this one web interface, change the SSID there, and it gets propagated out to all of the different access points. So let's go over to the computer so I can kind of show you what's going on with this, right? So what you do is you go to this, again, you go to this website, it's called cloudtracks.com, and once you've bought the equipment, um, they'll, they'll give you that website address, and when you do that, you will create an account. So let me just refresh this for a second. And when you've created an account, you'll, get a, you'll go through a, a normal little web Welcome wizard, but once you're done with that, you'll get a screen like this. And so this screen uh, gives you a bunch of different information. So this is where uh, you add or edit your nodes. So the node basically means a wireless access point. Uh, we have different users. If you want to create user accounts, you can do that there. The network location, then login ID for the network. You put in the time zone, the display name. Um, you put in all this other information, things like notifications or email alerts. You can put that information there. Then with uh, what's nice with Open Mesh is you can actually have two SSIDs. So you can have a public SSID and the private SSID. So here, you know, you put in a network name. So this just says Cloud Tracks. You can put a WPA key password in here or WPA2 only. F down beyond that, you can do things like you can create a splash page. So you want any splash page. So when somebody uh, starts using this wire the, the wireless network that you've created. Do you want do you want no splash page? Do you want uh, a splash page that you customize? Or do you want a Facebook Wi-Fi uh, splash page? So basically what this does is if you configure it, it essentially forces you to, to say that you're currently at a location. So let's say you have a large uh, cafe. You have a cafe with two or three floors. So you deploy these wireless access points, you create a network, and then all you ask of your users is in order to use a wireless network, all they have to do is say that you know, they're currently at your location on Facebook. You know, that's, that's a form of, of, of inexpensive advertising. Beyond that, you can go down here and they give you the ability to do uh, network throttling. So this can be very useful in the real world. Download limit, you know, or upload limit. So if you have a lot of users on your network to make sure your network doesn't get bogged down, you can then create white lists. You can have Mac uh, access control lists, walled garden, blocked devices. If you
you want to block devices, uh, block messages, VLAN tags. The other thing you can do is you can actually uh, connect this with PayPal to force people to pay in order to use your network if you want to use, do, do that. And then beyond that, you can have the uh, you can do bandwidth throttling for your PayPal clients. So this is the public network. So this is the network that everybody would use. And then you can have your private network. You enable a private network, um, you know, and the network name, the password, all that kind of stuff. So basically all of that information is here for you to use. Um, then what you do, uh, let's see, we can go over to radio. This just basically gives you some radio information and then advanced security and firewall, alternate servers, you know, upgrade the f uh, firmware, so on and so forth. Now, if we go over the general thing, let's say we want to add uh, access points. All we have to do is we have to add, click this add button here, uh, and this will bring up uh, this little page. And so this shows me the access points that I already have. So with this, uh, they, sh they show the geographic location. So I just found some random geographic location and put it there. Um, I can click on any of these access points to see the current information. So the green one is currently in use. And so I can see the name. Uh, so the name of it is hub. This is the MAC address. I can put a description. I can say what network it's in. I can reboot it. I can use it as spare, all that kind of stuff. I can X out of here. These are gray because they are currently down. So you can take a look at information about them, try to figure out what's going on. If I want to add an access point, I can just click here and I can add a name. So test and then the MAC address, all I would do is I would take whatever MAC address is on the, that particular uh, access point, plug it in here, and then with that, I'll be able to auto-associate that access point with my network, and then I'll be able to control it from there. Uh, so this, this is a little weird right here because they have this whole map thing going on. If you don't like the map thing, they also allow you uh, to add an overlay uh, for your network. Uh, where was that? So you could plug in an overlay here. So what the overlay allows you to do is you're actually able to upload a picture of your building and it, be able to use it that way. So you can try, you can show where every single access point is in your building, but you have to do that manually. And so this is all the configurations and settings uh, that you would do uh, in order to get your network up and running. Now, what, when, once your network is up and running, then you can go over here and you can click this button for network status. When we click the button for network status, this shows us what's going on with our our current network. So as you can see, I have three wireless access points associated with this network. I have the hub, I have what's called the circle, and I have the extender, right? Uh, this thing shows me uh, the uptime and it shows me the last check-in. So if I uh, refresh this, it'll, it'll show me what's going on. So the hub, so this is the, the access point that I know is still plugged into the network. And I can see that the last time uh, this particular access point checked in with a server was three minutes and 37 seconds ago. So I know it is still live. The uptime is three hours and 41 minutes because I unplugged it a little bit ago so I could play with it. Uh, the hops, uh, outages, it shows outages and that kind of stuff. I can come here and I can see the circle one. So the circle is one access point that I set up, but I actually never got it running on the network. So we can say that, see the last check-in was six days, six hours ago. So I can see it's not communicating uh, with the network. Then we can go over here to extender. So the, this extender access point is the one that I have been uh, showing you guys. So basically I unplugged this wireless access point so I could show you guys for the class. And so as you can see here, the last check-in for this access point was one hour, 38 minutes ago. So what's very useful about this is if you have 20 or 50 of these different access points and people start complaining of problems of being able to connect to the wireless network, I can go in here and see the last time any of these different uh, access points communicated with the server. If I see something like this where the last check-in was an hour ago, I can go, uh-oh, maybe somebody unplugged the wireless access point or it simply failed. But if, if people are saying that there's a problem, and I see the last time this thing checked in was an hour ago. I know that's probably where the problem was, right? Um, let's see here. 
Beyond that, it shows things like the network map. That's the map we showed before. Uh, we can go over, we can see the different clients. Um, so there's no clients currently connected. We can see a site survey. So one of the things I like with Open Mesh Equipment is it will show you the other wireless networks that it can see. Uh, so ETCG is my personal network. But even all the way out here in the country where I live, it also sees these two wireless networks. So again, if you have a large uh, wireless network, uh, installation and there's weird kind of intermittent problems by being able to look and see what other wireless networks can be seen you may see where the problem is so we see Bluebird and ETCG are both using the same channel 11 so if I was having problems then I would know okay maybe I need to switch ETCG to a different channel we go through there we do a little network diagram it kind of shows us how the uh, the different access points are communicating with each other so as we can see the hub is the access point is green that actually has a connection to the internet we can see extender connects to hub and we can see circle hasn't connected to anybody because again it hasn't plugged in beyond that we can go up here and we can actually see the statistics so how people are using our wireless network uh, let me do let's see here refresh and so basically, uh, we can go back here and we can click more. And so this shows us how our users are using the wireless network. So we can see here, we can see some jackass on our, our network is using a lot of YouTube. Look at that. Some jackass has used 1.2 gigs of bandwidth for YouTube. Uh, so if I was worried about that, I could go, hmm, maybe I need to block YouTube uh, connections, right? So if I have a network and everything is slowing down, what I can do is I can come here, see how people are using the wireless network to see maybe there's something I need to block. If there's no reason for anybody to get to YouTube on my particular network and the network is slowing down, I can then come in and basically block YouTube. Beyond that, I mean, it shows me all, you know, what's going on with my network. YouTube, Google, Google+, Plus, Amazon. On Twitter, so on and so forth. It shows me the amount that has been uploaded. It shows me the amount that has been downloaded. It shows me the total usage. So again, I can come in here and I can try to figure out what's going on with my network. Oh, people are using a lot of Google. Uh, maybe I need to shut that down or, or figure what's going on. So with all of these, these little configurations and all these settings, it makes it really, 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 really easy to run uh, and run, set up, install, maintain a wireless network uh, with, with, with not much expense. Again, you can buy these little guys from OpenMesh uh, from anywhere from $55 up to $240. So realistically, I mean, if you, even the $100 versions, guys, if you bought, let's say you bought 20 of these for 100 bucks a piece, that's $2,000. Uh, each one of these enclosures, they're kind of expensive to be honest with you, but they're 20 bucks. So let's say you bought 20, uh, that's like $2,400 plus some power supplies and stuff. I mean, what you have to think about is for, let's say for $2,600, you could build a 20 wireless access point network. Now, let me tell you, if you were watching my videos, <laughs> A 20 wireless access point network is far bigger than most of you guys will ever have to deal with. Some of you guys are full-fledged enterprise and you've got, you know, thousands of access points. But very few people in the world need more than 20 access points. And so for less than $3,000 in hardware costs, you could build a mesh 20 access point network that is pretty impressive you add in your billables and and that that that's a pretty good deal because again one of the things i want you guys to think about uh, i i heard before i've been talking about this open mesh equipment for a little while now and there's a lot of people that are complaining it's like oh it's part of the cloud you know you're 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 trusting that uh that whoever runs the cloud tracks web server isn't going to screw you over it's not going to get hacked anything like that and what you have to realize in the real world is that again, geeks cost a lot of money. What I'm trying to get through your guys' heads is people like me earn a lot of money. A lot of money, right? And so for these businesses, what they have to weigh is they can think, I can spend $2,600 and get a very robust, very reliable network that basically a help desk administrator can configure for $20 an hour. 
or I can build some kind of Cisco wireless network with a wireless controller. That equipment, again, what you have to think about is an Aeronet, a Cisco Aeronet wireless access point, each one is about five to six hundred dollars and that's not even including the controller that's going to control it and then that's not including that you actually have to know how the hell to configure that and you actually have to have experience like with this i mean if if you like computers you can sit down and figure out how to set up this this uh, wireless network in about three hours if you set up a cisco wireless network that's going to take you a long time to figure out. Again, you're probably going to have to pay a professional. That's probably going to charge you $150 something, $200 per hour to come in and configure. And it gets really, 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 really expensive quick. So that's why, like I say, this open mesh equipment uh, seems like a good idea because it's, it's just something. It gives you a lot of re reliability. It gives you a lot of robustness. It gives you a lot of power at a price point that you can afford. And in a user interface that an average computer geek can actually use without needing 200 hours of extra training. So that's why it seems pretty cool. So if you're interested in this, again, this isn't a review. I don't have a big enough environment here uh, to try to push a lot of data and tell you exactly what the throughput on these things are. Uh, but I would say definitely take a look at it. If you are in a business environment, um, again, if you, a lot, especially if you like, if you have small offices, that type of thing, I would definitely say drop a couple hundred bucks, buy a few of these test it out in a lab, test it out in, in, in your small office environment, because I think you'll be impressed. I have so far been very impressed with these things. Uh, the only complaint I really have is, is the user interface is a bit wonky, uh, but otherwise, I mean, everything seems to, to configure and do what it's supposed to very well. I mean, the only, the only thing that I would say is I'm really questioning is just this whole external enclosure type deal. Like the idea that I'm gonna take this access point i'm gonna put it in here i'm gonna i'm gonna shove it in this little container and then i'm going to put this out into the maryland weather and our weather around here uh again goes up to about 100 percent humidity can get 105 in the summer and can get down to about zero degrees uh, fahrenheit in the winter this is the only thing I really don't trust it with, to be honest with you. But that, that may just be my own bias. But again, at 100 bucks a piece, it might be worth it just to buy a few, <laughs> and even if they die. Oops, you know what I'm saying? Again, sometimes that's a reality. Sometimes how we keep our networks up and running is we just buy inexpensive equipment, and then we throw it away as it fails. Again, the nice part with cloud tracks and all that is it's very easy to see when the equipment fails, right? So you, so you just buy an extra five access points uh, in case any of yours fail. As soon as one fails, you see that it failed. You go, you swap it out. You, you take you know, 20 minutes and swap it out, and then it works fine. Yeah, you know, one of those things to think about. But anyways, if you're interested in this, it is open mesh, open hyphen mesh. This is uh, mesh wireless networking equipment. Again, the big thing to remember with this, whenever you deal with this, is you do need a router with DNS and DHCP and all those networking services in order to make this stuff function. Open mesh, for whatever reason, doesn't sell that wireless router. So this is simply mesh networking equipment, no DNS, no DHCP, any of that kind of stuff. So if you need those services, make sure something else on the network is providing it. Is managing users and computers on Active Directory too cumbersome? Download SolarWinds' terrific trio of free Active Directory admin tools today and start saving time on those Active Directory management tasks. These free tools help you manage and remove computers and users from Active Directory and allow you to add users in bulk. The free tools uh, include inactive user account removal tool enables you to scan Active Directory and optionally remove users who have not logged in for a certain amount of time. Inactive computer account removal tool enables you to scan Active directory and optionally remove computers that are over a certain number of days old and user import tool saves time by giving you the ability to create users in bulk using a CSV file. You can even specify the attributes. Also be sure to check out SolarWinds community page thwack.com to connect with more than 100,000 IT professionals. So take a look at solarwinds.com for their free and other tools. SchoolyMitchell.com. If you're trying to find better internet or telephone service or if you're trying to find less expensive internet or telephone service, give Schooly Mitchell a call. Basically what these guys 
guys are. These guys are telecom consultants. You call them, you say what you need for yourself or your client, and they figure out the best option. They'll examine your existing services and review your bills to make sure there are no errors. Then they'll keep an eye on your services moving forward so that everything remains optimized. Because Schooly Mitchell is objective and independent, they have no ties to vendors. You know they are always your best interests in mind. The best part is there is no fee for their services. The only cost is a portion of the shared savings over a set period of time. If they don't find savings, there is no cost to you. Schooly Mitchell. Plixer.com. Plixer deals with NetFlow analytics software. So NetFlow is a component of Cisco equipment that shows you what's going on at the network layer. What devices are talking to what other devices, what kind of network jitter, all of that kind of stuff. So Plixer has a free piece of software called Scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a free NetFlow network traffic analysis tool. So if you want to play around with NetFlow, if you want to see what's going on with the network layer and you have Cisco equipment, take a look at Plixer.com. Click on the link below this video. It'll bring you to this page where you can download Scrutinizer, the free NetFlow network traffic analysis, analysis tool. Altero.com, A-L-T-A-R-O.com. If you're dealing with virtualization in a Hyper-V environment, so we're talking about Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2, take a look at Altero.com. They have a number of Hyper-V backup solutions. They have the free version, which will back up up to two VMs for free forever. They also have the unlimited version, starting at only $400 per host. I think this is a very good value. So if you are dealing with Hyper-V virtualization and you need a backup solution, take a look at altero.com. NerdsweCanFixThat.com. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, but you don't want to have to worry about coming up with a logo and copyright and trademark and all of those kinds of things, you may think about buying into a computer services franchise system. Nerds We Can Fix That is a computer services franchise system. They have 62 franchises throughout the United States. They can franchise in every state other than Hawaii. They also franchise internationally. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, you should contact them, fill out the information below, or give them a call. Again, as I will say, franchise systems are great for a lot of people, not so good for others always make sure to do your due diligence but if you're thinking about starting a computer services company anyway you might as well contact nerds we can fix that to see what they have to say veeam.com v-e-e-a-m.com if you just virtualized 100 servers and now you're trying to figure out how to back them up they have solutions for esxi they have solutions for hyper v and as you guys like they have free stuff so if you are dealing with a virtualized environment and you're trying to figure out a backup solution take a look at veeam.com Spiceworks.com. These guys have the free network management software, the free mobile device management software, the free community with millions of users. So if you need, if you're an IT professional and you need support, Spiceworks is a great place to go. All of their stuff is basically free and just an absolutely great thing. Again, if you have any questions that I don't answer in the show that are technical in nature, you know, we're talking about Active Directory synchronization between sites in remote areas. Uh, if you click on the link below this video, that will take you to the Spiceworks community. They have millions of users there that will be able to help you out. So take a look at Spiceworks.com. So today's hands-on review, I'm showing you guys the Icy Dock Blizzard hard drive enclosure. So this is a hard drive enclosure from the company Icy Dock, and basically what this is built for is it's built to cool your hard drive to reduce the wear and tear on it. So let's go over to my little demo table so I can kind of show you what's going on with this guy, because I think it's a pretty cool idea. So if you look at this, this looks much larger than your normal hard drive enclosure, right? So you're used to seeing something about, about this size here, but seeing this massive thing on the front, that's new. Well, what this is, is this is a fan. So it's got a pretty big fan on here, and what it does is it sucks air in the front and then shoots it out the back. So the idea is that a lot of hard drives fail simply from heat. There's a lot of complaints when you go out and you buy many uh, external hard drive enclosures because they don't have any vents or they don't have any fans in them, and so people feel as if the hard drives get cooked. And so the idea here is you put a nice big fan on this uh, external enclosure to make sure you keep your hard drive cool. This can be very useful if you're doing things like uh, data backups, any kind of uh, hard drive intensive tasks, basically trying to keep the heat down on the hard drive so it will last a while longer. Now, if you're looking at this thing, uh, not only does it have the nice uh, fan on it to keep things cool, but it also has USB 3.0 connection and eSATA 
on the back here, uh, depending on what setting you want this to be on, you can set the fan to be either on high, to be low, or to be automatic. So basically you can say, you know, how cool you want the, uh, the hard drive to be. And then there's a little switch here to, uh, to change the lights in it. So as with all new technology, there's got to be fancy LEDs. And so that little thing in back and allows you to screw around to, to, with the LED settings. Now, what I like, one of the things I like about IC Dock is not only is the equipment built very well and designed very well, but it's very easy to use. So with this, if you want to swap the hard drive, what's really nice is all you have to do is you push in these two buttons on the side of it, and then you can pop off this front bit. And and so this front bit is how you access the hard drive. So this is the fan. You can see your nice big fan in there. So it does take up the entire space. And then if you want to pull your hard drive out, this is all you have to do. So again, this is good if you're dealing with uh, data recovery operations because it's very easy to pull the drive in and out. So, you know, if you grab somebody's old 2004 computer and you can hear clicking and you can hear worrying on the hard drive and you want to pull the data off, but, you know, you want to be very, very careful with it so it doesn't die you can pull the drive out of the computer all you have to do is you just shove it in in here that easily you just put the lid on as so plug it in and away you go that's one of the things like I said I really like about IC dock is just everything is built very well everything works very very smoothly things slip in things slip out it's not like a lot of the other equipment out there where it's just like I say, it's a real pain in the butt to use. So this is the IC Dock Blizzard. Uh, again, very, very, very good uh, for what it, what it is. Again, built very well, very easy to use. And the, I can tell you the fan on it uh, is very powerful. Now, when you do turn this on, you do hear the fan. So if this is sitting like uh, on your desk by your computer, what I will say is you can hear the fan, but it's not too bad. I mean, it sounds like a fan. If you get what I'm saying. Like it's that big and it sounds like a fan. So it's not a silent operation, but it's not, I don't know, I would say it's not very, not horrible. If we go over to the computer, uh, just to show you what's going on with this. Uh, again, if you go over to icdoc.com, you can you can find uh, the, the item. And again, like I say, it's called the Blizzard, the MB080U3S1SB. You can get all the information. Now, if you go over to newegg.com, you can find this over there and you can purchase it from them for about $70. So that's about the, the best price point you're gonna get, $69.99. And I mean, here's what I'll say about that price. That, that price, I will admit, that price is high for enclosures. Uh, on the other hand, this is actually a very well-built enclosure. So, you know, back in the day, I bought a lot of enclosures, like hundreds of enclosures uh, back when I owned my own consulting company. So I can tell you there are a lot of crappy enclosures out there you can buy for 30 bucks. But again, they're crap. They're 30 bucks, but they're crappy. <laughs> so, you know, being $70, it does seem a little pricey, but again, as I will say, it is built very well, like all IC Dock equipment. Um, as you could see when I was playing with it, uh, you know, the operation and everything else on it is very easy, smooth to use. And again, this is something that you don't get out of a lot of enclosures. I mean, the fact that everything just fits so perfectly and it just works so well. So yes, $70 is more expensive than the other enclosures, but this is built at least twice as well and I would try it trust it about five times as much. So if you're interested, again, this is the IC Dock Blizzard external hard drive enclosure. Um, I, like I said, I, I would give it a thumbs up. The, the only question here, and I'll, be, I'll admit to it, the only question here is that $70 price tag, but again, with all things in the technology world, if it's what you need, uh, it's a reasonable price, and if it's not what you need, then don't buy it. <laughs>So this question comes from Carlos D. Eli, I had an idea, hear me out. I get a lot of clients who have messed up slow computers. One common issue is a lag when someone types to the time it takes to be seen on the screen, amongst other things. What if I could have them send me an image or take an image of their system, then put it on something I have at the lab, fix it up, re-image it, and give the fixed image back to them? My main question is how do images work? So this is one of those great ideas 
that I think every new geek gets in their heads uh, until they realize what an abhorrent pain in the buttocks this would be, right? So one of the questions that comes up now, now that we're all trying to do remote work, you know, back in the day, it used to be very normal that, you know, we as technicians would go to client offices or client homes, we would fix the computers there, and we would get paid a lot of money for that. We get paid $100 an hour, you take four hours to, to fix a virus on a computer, and you walk out with 400 bucks in your pocket. And I'm not exaggerating with that. that. That's really how it was. Well, obviously, nowadays, uh, people don't want to pay $400. Most people don't want to pay $400 to simply get a virus that's taken off their computer. So the question is, is how can we make this whole process more efficient uh, so that we can make more money off of it? Basically, you know, we don't charge each client uh as much money, but the idea is we get more clients, right? So basically, how do we make this process work? So one of the things that comes up is basically doing remote administration, you know, using something like LogMeIn Rescue or TeamViewer or UltraVNC, something like that, to remote control uh, the computer, go in and try to clean up the computer that way. That works great as long as the computer is working pretty well to begin with, you know. Uh, but when you're dealing with PCs, there's a difference between the computer being a bit slow and a computer being basically useless. So doing remote administration is really great if the computer is acting a bit slow. It has a little bit of malware, maybe a virus or two, needs some updates, then remote administration is great. But what if it's just, it's just a dog? It's just, even when you you type you know you type you know it, it, there's a lag before anything comes up on the screen then you're going to have to interact with that uh, operating system one way or another basically in person remote doing remote administration just isn't going to work simply because most likely you won't be able to install the remote administrative client and even if you can it's 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 just going to be a slug to to deal with so when you're dealing with an issue like that, you know, the, the possibilities are either you can go to the client, you're going to end up charging them $400 for the repair, they're not going to like that. They can bring the system to you, not against that, that works very well. Basically what you do in those situations is you line four computers up at a time and do them all together, you still come out with 400 bucks, right? So... It may, it'll take you four or five hours to process all four or five computers, but you charge $100 per computer, so you're still making $100 an hour. Uh, the client gets a lower price. You still make the money that you should be making as a geek, that is that's what's good. So if you're in a if you're in a like a town area, uh, if you're dealing with local clients, I would just tell I would just say have them bring the computer to you. Say you know a hundred dollars uh, for a computer tune up, and you get a thirty day warranty with that. They bring the computer to you. You put it on the workbench with a lot of other computers. Go at it, and away you go. That would be your best bet. Now this guy comes up with the idea is what well, what about doing an image, right? So what happens with images is you take an exact copy of the entire hard drive with the operating system, configurations, the viruses, the malware, all of it. It's, it's, it's basically, it's taking a picture, it's taking a snapshot of that entire hard drive uh, and putting it on a disk or putting it on some kind of other storage uh, platform. The reason you normally use images in, in the real world is if you're deploying a lot of identical computers. So when I worked in the enterprise uh, environment, we had hundreds and thousands of computers that all were basically the same. The only difference in any of these computers was who logged into it and like the Outlook configurations, right? So basically you have the person log in, you go in, you mess with the Outlook configurations and that's it. Everybody gets Adobe Reader, everybody gets Word, everybody gets Excel, everybody gets PowerPoint, so on and so forth. So in that kind of environment, you, you don't want to have to, to do a, a real install of an operating system uh, and all of these programs every single time because it's just not worth the effort, right? Um, if you do a full install with updates and everything, it's gonna take you three or four hours, where if you can image uh, a copy of a single hard drive uh, and then deploy that image, it'll only take somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the speed of the computer, right? So that, that just makes everybody's life better. So a lot of people, that, that's why images are used, is basically in those enterprise environments. So one of the th things, you know, a lot of new geeks think is, hey, well, what about if I have my client image their computer uh, take that disk, uh, send it to me, I will somehow uh, pull the image off 
that I was given, be able to mess with that computer, basically fix that computer up, and then send it back to them, uh, wouldn't that be good? Basically, isn't that all the benefits uh, of every world? They get the inexpense of being able to, to ship their computer off to me, and I can do it in mass. I actually be able to get to be able to physically work with the operating system. It should all be good. The problem is, is, is images are a bugger to deal with. Why images work really well in the enterprise world is basically because you're replicating the same process 10,000 times. You, you, there is there, there's no differential in the process. You have you have 10,000 Dell Optiplex 55,000s, right? You create one image for those 10,000 Optiplexes, and then you restore that image to all 10,000 Optiplexes. They're all Optiplexes. They've all got four gigs of RAM. They all have an i7 whatever processor. They all basically have the same hard drive. They all have the same video cards. They all have the same sound cards. They all have the same thing. So basically, it's just replicating. You're doing the exact same thing 10,000 times. The issue is once you start dealing with clients, Client computers. This client has a Dell Optiplex 5500. This one has an HP piece of garbage 6700. This one has a Lenovo Aura whatever, right? And so the problem is, is all those different computers, they have different drivers, they have different hardware, they have different specifications, they have all that. So the, the issue is, is even if you could get them to image their, their computer, when they ship it to you, you're going to have issues actually being able to restore that image uh, to actually make it use worthwhile, actually useful, so you can configure it. Uh, and then after you've done all the changes you need to do, then sending that image back to them to for them to install install on their computer is just going to be kind of a bit of a mess. And especially one of the questions come, that comes up is what are you going to do with that image? Or what exactly are they going to image? Are they going to image the entire drive? And if they're going to image their entire drive, again, we're not dealing with an enterprise environment where that entire drive might be 30 gigs. Y you know, if, if, if I have my entire iTunes movie collection on my computer and I image that, that might be a two terabyte image if the image software even supports two terabytes. And then you gotta move it, it's just tedious and horrible and nasty. So basically what I would say is it looks really good on paper. That is uh, using images in this way for like computer repair looks very good on paper. On paper, it looks like an amazing idea that you wonder why nobody is doing. And then you find out why nobody is doing it. But that, that, I think that's one of the lessons you should learn in, in, in the technology world. If something seems like a really good idea and a really good plan, and it seems like people should have been doing this for the past decade, and then you find out nobody at all is doing it, there's probably a reason. That, that's basically what you come back to with, with images is especially in the modern world, deal, dealing with that kind of image would just be an utter horrible pain in the butt. So I, what I would say, honestly, is if you need to be able to work on the operating system, clean it up, have them bring uh, the computer to you, um, and go from there. That is, that is, that is what I would honestly say uh, is the best bet. Yeah, images, images are great in an enterprise environment for mass deployments. Otherwise, they can be a royal pain in the butt. So this question comes from Richard S. Eli, I watched your installation of Ubuntu on YouTube today. I downloaded, burned, and booted from the disk only to find out my older Dell laptop CPU is too old to accommodate Ubuntu server version of Linux. Is there another distribution that will work on older CPUs? So this is a bit of an interesting question because honestly, when I first read this question, um, I was immediately going to give one answer. And then as I started reading this in one particular word really struck me, um, I realized I might have to give you two different answers. Uh, so basically going along with this, I'm looking at this and saying, okay, so you, you're, you're trying to install a new version of Ubuntu, and for whatever reason, it is too powerful uh, to run on your, your computer. So basically, your computer does not have uh, the resources to run the latest version of Ubuntu. So this is a pretty normal thing in the Linux world. Again, Linux, like all other operating systems, uh, it's got some issues 
issues with bloatware. You know what I'm saying? As time goes on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and starts using more and more resources. And all of a sudden, that, that super sleek, fast, sexy operating system is a bit of a slug, right? And so you, you need a computer that, that can handle all of that. So the nice part with Ubuntu or any of the other Linux distributions is since they are not proprietary and since people basically are not making money off of them, you can actually go back and find the older versions of the, uh, of the distribution and use those to find something that match the resources of your computer, right? So, you know, when Microsoft comes out with Windows 8 or Windows 10 or whatever the, the next piece of garbage they're going to come out with is, right? One of the biggest problems with Microsoft that almost everybody would agree is a really big problem is that they stop producing the older operating system entirely. So they no longer make Windows XP. They're going to stop making Windows Vista. They don't make Windows 2000. They don't make Windows 95. They don't make Windows 98, right? So if you have an old computer that the, you know, it's got 32 megs of RAM on it and you want to use a Windows operating system, you can't simply go out and buy a new version of Windows 98 even if you wanted to, right? Microsoft doesn't produce it. They want you using Windows 8 come hell or high water, right? Because that, that's where they, they make their profit on. They want you continually going into the future. The nice part with Linux is they don't have that profit mo motivation to be such asshats about things. And so the, the older distributions are still available for you to download. You may have to do a little research. Uh, you may have to Google it a little bit. But you can go out and you can find Ubuntu version 4 or Ubuntu version 8 or Ubuntu version 10 or Ubuntu version 1. See what the requirements for that Ubuntu version is and be able to install it and go from there, right? So the nice part with Linux, whatever you're doing with Linux, you know, whether it's Fedora or Ubuntu or CentOS, any of these open source ones, you should be able to find all of the versions going back to literally version one and be able to pick whichever one you want to use. Now, let's be honest, it's not going to be fully updated. It's not going to have all the latest drivers. It's not going to have all the latest stuff because it's version one or five or six or whatever, but you should be able to go out and find it. And the nice part is, is if you have an older computer and you use an older operating system, it'll work good enough. Now, here's the thing though, you know, I'm looking at this and, and that's the answer I was going to give you and I, I wasn't going to think twice about it. But then I noticed what you say, Ubuntu server version of Linux and that you're having problem with uh, the CPU, or the, the, the computer resources in order to run the server version of Ubuntu. The server version of Ubuntu doesn't need a lot of resources. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the actual resources are, but they ain't much. I mean, they, 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 in order to run the server version of Ubuntu, you should basically be able to use any 10-year-old computer, and it'll work. It may not be the best thing in the world as a server, but it should be fine, right? Because when you use a server version of Ubuntu, you don't have the graphical user interface that burns up a lot of resources. You don't have to worry about Adobe Flash that burns up a lot of resources. You don't have to worry about JavaScript. You don't have to worry about all those graphical elements. All that graphical stuff uh, is really good for the end user to make it more uh, user friendly. But and sucks from, from the, the resource requirements. So if you download the Ubuntu, the Ubuntu server version, all you should get is a command line interface, basically, you know, that little cursor blinking at you, so you type in commands, and that shouldn't require very many resources at all. So what I'm thinking is if your computer is so old that it doesn't even run the server version of Ubuntu, you need to go out and spend 50 bucks on some piece of crap eight-year-old computer and buy that. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of you guys try to use computers a bit too long. If you have a computer from 2000, that's now been 14 years ago, you just need to get rid of it. Go out, find, find like a 2008, 2009 computer, you know, throw somebody 50 bucks for that that thing, and that would be the way to go. So that that's that's what I would say. Generally, you can go back and you can find all the versions of whatever distribution of Linux you want. So again, go back and maybe maybe Ubuntu version 8 or Ubuntu version 9 will work on your system. But again, as I say, if your computer doesn't have the, the, the resources to run Ubuntu server... Uh, I'm thinking it's time simply to trash that uh, that particular computer. Go out, spend fifty bucks on some six-year-old computer, uh, and and you'll be better off. So the final thought for today is I want to talk about religion.
Or more correctly, I want to talk about not wanting to talk about religion. So last night, uh, I was on geekbraindump.com, and I was doing my normal moderation duties and going through all the comments and making sure everybody was being polite and nice and all that kind of stuff. And I ran across a very interesting comment on a post that somebody had written. So uh, basically, when uh, I launched geekbraindump.com, or really pushed it back in the spring, it was really insane how quickly it grew. It just grew like that quick. It went from nothing to getting between 15 to 20 posts per day. And then just as quick, uh, basically at the end of August, the beginning of September, September, uh, all those posts died off. So now we get a, eh, maybe one post a day, one post every other day. It's still growing, but it's definitely not 20 posts uh, per day. Uh, and somebody, somebody wrote a post uh, basically asking the other writers on geekbrandump.com why they are not writing so much, right? And so I was looking through, and basically the answers are pretty much what I had heard before. You know, people got busy, people ran out of ideas, people were really excited at first, and then, well, they got bored and went off and did other things. Hey, no. No harm, no foul, I understand. But then one particular comment uh, really uh, stuck out to me, and it was interesting. I just want to talk about it a little bit uh, here, because I think it really uh, is an important business concept in the, the modern world. And so one of the things, that, the, the comment that stuck out was a person said that because one of the reasons that they don't feel like they want to write so much for geekbraindump.com is because I created a new rule about a month and a half, two months ago, stating that no religious content should be in uh, the the geekbraindump.com post, right? So if you're writing a post, I don't care if you're an Apple fanboy or a Linux fanboy or a Windows fanboy or a Tizen fanboy, uh, but I don't want to see stuff about Allah and I don't want to see stuff about Jesus and I don't want to see all this other thing, right? And that was that was one of those things, just so you guys understand, that was one of those rules uh, that I had to create for a specific reason and then I had to be very strict on it because the question is, is where do you draw the lines on things? So when I came up with geekbraindump.com, one, one of the underlying principles of geekbraindump.com is I don't want to edit you guys. Um, I don't want to censor you guys. I, I don't want to do any of that. Basically, essentially, this is a platform for you to talk about whatever it is uh, you want to talk about within the technology realm and to show the world how smart you are, right? So I don't edit your posts. I don't change a lot in your posts. Uh, basically, as long as it doesn't look like it was, it was done by a bot, uh, as long as it doesn't look like it was complete plagiarism, as long as it's at least, at least 250 words. I really don't really care much about what you say because the idea is I am giving you a platform so that you can give that to, to potential employers in the future and say, hey, I wrote 25 posts for geekbraindump.com. Why don't you go there and see what I wrote if, if you want to know what I know? And then, then your employer or whatever can go there and go, hey, this guy's pretty smart. They, they actually knows what he's talking about, right? So a couple of months ago, you know, this, this is my laissez-faire. I was like, eh, do whatever the hell you want to do on geekbraindump.com as long as it's technological. technological. Uh, but the problem came about is about two months ago, I, I started getting these posts from this one writer, and it was all just basically uh, religious propaganda. It really, really, really was. It was like... I, f I forget how to, but it was just like, it was like, this. I mean, it was just, it was just religious sermons and everything else. Um, and the problem that I find is that in the modern world, a lot of people want to proselytize, right? They say, I have found God, or I have found Allah, or I found Jesus, or I have found the flying spaghetti monster. And since I have found the flying spaghetti monster, I believe that everybody should come into the, the, the saucy goodness of the spaghetti monster, and I am going to beat everyone over over the head uh, until they convert to, to my religion. The issue is, in the, the post-September 11th world, is I'm finding people are getting very, very, very edgy on this whole idea of religion. I mean, we've got Muslims, the, the Islamic world, there's a lot of fighting going on. We have Christians getting involved with the fight, and we have Jewish folks getting involved with the fight. You, you, just, you just got a lot of just religious animosity out there. Um, and people aren't overly kind about it, right? Religion is just simply one one of those subjects that if you want to piss somebody off really really, really quick, bring up religion, and things go downhill quickly. And so one of the issues that I run into is even though, um, you know, I, I am an American um, content creator, uh, the my viewer base is truly global. I mean, I really do. I really have viewers in Syria. I really do have viewers in Mogadishu. I really do have viewers in Hong Kong. I really do have viewers in Europe. I have viewers 
all over the place. And so all the people that are that are producing content for geekbraindump.com, the thing is they have lots and lots and lots of different religious views and they hold those views very closely. And so the last thing in the world that I want is a religious flame war on geekbraindump.com because it just doesn't, from my perspective, it just doesn't fit there. Again, I, I am Buddhist and I admit that I am Buddhist, but I don't really try to bring it up too much other than where it, it specifically may come up. It's like, I'm not, I just feel that, that religion is kind of one of those those issues that really can actually bring out the worst in people very quickly. So when this person started writing all these posts and doing the whole proselytizing, basically I pinged them and said, yeah, this isn't really good. Just, just, just stop with the entire post about, about proselytizing for Jesus Christ or whatever. And then after that, basically there started to be more posts where it wasn't like the entire post, was it? But it was a chunk of the post. And so that's where I just decided as the owner of the site just to completely eliminate any of the religious stuff. Because one of the issues that you then come to uh, if, if you are running a platform, if you're running an organization, is where do you draw the line, right? Uh, if you're going to say, I don't want entire sermons on geekbraindump.com, does that mean you can have half a sermon on geekbraindump.com or a paragraph of a sermon on geekbraindump.com or maybe three sentences of a sermon, but the best three sentences of a sermon? So even though it's only three sentences, it has the power of an entire sermon right? You just get into that entire mess. And so that, that's why I decided uh, to essentially to eliminate uh, all the religious stuff. Because again, in the modern world, it can just bring a lot of angst. It can just bring a lot of anger. And it's one of those things that you really have to ask yourself, is this really appropriate? I mean, one of the things that a lot of people, especially in the American world, don't really realize is there are a lot of people, there are a lot of human beings on this planet that honestly believe believe that the current things going on, the, the current military events that are going on in the Middle East, basically, you know, are, are the equivalent of the 30th or 40th or 50th or whatever else, or whatever else crusade, right? So whenever you guys think of, most Americans think of the crusades, we think of these archaic events that happened way back in the Middle Ages. But if you're looking at it uh, from a lot of the, the Islamic perspective, you've looking at it from a lot of the Middle Eastern perspective, what is going on now in the Middle East really does look like a crusade. Basically, you have uh, a lot of Muslim nations that are getting attacked by Christian nations. Um, our own president, our glorious George Bush, or ex-president, uh, used, to, used to tout the fact that we are a Christian country uh, uh, pushing our ideals, and if we are a Christian country pushing our, our ideals, and we're bombing the hell out of Muslim nations, if that's not the definition of a crusade, I mean, that's just, right? And so going into all this kind of stuff, it's just it's just a bad, bad, bad thing in the modern world. You know what I'm saying? I would like, like us to come together over TCP IP and HTML5 and whether motion JavaScript is better than Flash. Getting into all that, like, like I can have an argument with you guys over Linux and Apple and Windows, and it doesn't really get that bad or nasty. Whereas, like I say, you get into the religion stuff and it gets goes downhill really, really, really quickly. So if that makes sense, that is basically why I, I took all the religious stuff uh, or I banned the religious stuff off of geekbraindump.com. I just truly, honestly do not believe uh, geekbraindump.com is the appropriate place for it. I genuinely, from my heart of hearts, it's supposed to be a technical place uh, where you try to prove to people why you're so cool and you should get hired. In the modern world, um, religion is a huge flashpoint for a lot of people and so I think it's just best it's kind of one of those things you know again what I want you guys to understand is whatever you guys want to say to your families I don't care friends I don't care what church you go to I don't care but there are these intersections where you start dealing with other people where there's just a time and place for things and I would argue with geekbraindump.com uh, religion has there's just no time and place it's, it's just not the time and place, if that makes any sense. So those are my thoughts. I don't know. If I lose all the Christians and Muslims out there, oh, well, I'm just going to keep trying to make the world just a tiny bit better place so the, the flying spaghetti monster will take me up into the pasta league goodness.
I'm happy to say that our Patreon campaign for a better world for geeks is trucking along pretty nicely. So we are now up to $122 per month from 29 patrons. If you don't know what's going on here, basically what I did was I created a Patreon campaign. You probably have heard of other YouTube content creators uh, creating uh, Patreon campaigns in order for them to get paid. Well, I decided to flip it on, on its head. So basically what I'm doing is I am taking money from you guys that you feel that I deserve, and then I'm going to be putting it into good things for the geek community. Donating to, uh, to nonprofits that promote technology, sponsoring events that inspire inservation, innovation, investing in ventures that are trying to build a better future using technology, so on and so forth. If you have any questions about how dedicated I am to this project, Project. I honestly just donated $5,000 to code in the schools to teach Baltimore City school students how to program a couple of days ago. I've also donated five laptops and I've donated quite a bit of money over the years. And so basically what this is, is you guys have reached out to me and said, hey Eli, you're doing such a good thing for us. We would like to donate. And so what I am saying is instead of donating to me so that I can use it to go off to Miami Beach or something, I'm saying if you honestly believe that I'm providing something that is of value to you that you would like to give me money for, if you give money to this Patreon campaign, I will then take that money and again push it into things that I think will help move the whole world to a geekier place. So take a look at the patreon.com forward slash Eli the computer guy campaign. If you want to uh, donate any money to this, feel free to. And if you don't want to do donate any money to it, feel free not to. I'm just kind of showing you guys what's going on and I'm very happy to say in just a little over a week we already have 29 patrons giving $122 per month. So, so I think this will be a pretty good thing going into the next few months.